Uh, is that the, the French one starring Donald yeah. Rumsfeld? Yes, I, I have seen it. Yeah. I, I, when I first saw it, I was for those, for those who aren't familiar with The Dark Side of the Moon, this is a program which initially appears to be uh, about the moon hoax. Uh, and it, it, quote, it has interviews with all sorts of people saying amazing things that seem to support the feeling of moon hoax. But as you travel further and further through the program, the statements become more and more outrageous until it all sort of collapses in the end and you realise that these were people who were interviewed quite genuinely and their answers were very carefully edited out of context as a joke. So it's effectively a hoax about the hoax. <laughs> it was this show on April Fool's Day. Yeah. And I think a lot of people didn't realise that. <laughs> <laughs> so gentlemen, the much of that. I have a question just regarding the, when the lunar module takes off from the uh, moon, the camera nicely uh, tracks and pans and and um, how did they manage to do that? Uh, that was the third astronaut who was left behind on the moon that nobody talks about. <laughs> seriously, uh, no, seriously, the, uh, the camera was remote controlled from the Earth. And if you watch uh, footage of those particular missions uh, while the astronauts are still on the moon, you can see that the camera tracks around and follows two astronauts on the moon. Uh, and clearly there's no third astronaut there. It was controlled by remote, it was remote controlled from the Earth and the operator had to learn to anticipate what was going to happen. In terms of tracking the liftoff of the lunar module from the moon, uh, he had three tries and he got tried for the third time. On Apollo 15 and Apollo 16, the liftoff was not properly tracked. Uh, on Apollo 17, he finally got it right. These guys practiced this sort of activity uh, incessantly in the months leading up to a, to a mission. So they knew, what, uh, they knew what sort of lead time they had to, uh, had to have to ensure that they sent the command to start tracking up something like four seconds before they saw the, uh, the little module actually lift off from the moon. I don't know if I convinced you all. <laughs> yes? Peter, in your wanderings through this lovely little game, have you managed to find out who the moons were the start of this nonsense? Um, my experience has been that there was scepticism about the moon landings even in 1969. The people were saying, now there's no way they're dead. There were just people who thought it was just too fantastic to happen. The guy who really kick-started the, uh, the whole hoax movement is a guy called Bill Casey, uh, who died a couple of years ago. He wrote a book in 1974 which promoted the theory. And um, he got a lot of publicity with, uh, once the internet came into existence, and by constantly getting radio interviews on uh, some of the more um, fringe uh, AM stations in America. Uh, his theories are truly um, off the planet to the extent that um, uh, his, his most, and, and frankly they're, they're, some of the arguments are quite obscene. His, his worst one is that um, the Challenger accident in 1986 where the space shuttle exploded shortly after launch was that the object of that was to kill the teacher in space, Christopher Corliff, because she did not agree to say that stars were invisible in space. So rather than just ground her or arrange for a little accident on the Earth to make it possible for her to go into space, they decided to destroy an entire shuttle and kill six other astronauts to um, presumably to get the message across. That's the level of his, uh, of, of his arguments. Um, other people have followed since then and the internet has basically made it worse. Yes, Fenton. What's the, I think one of the hoax arguments relates to the fluttering of the flag. And I was wondering what that argument is and also how it's addressed by your points. The, uh, the argument about the flag is that if you look at photographs of the, uh, of the astronauts on the moon, you can clearly see the flag sticking out at an angle with beautiful ripples and it looks like it's, uh, it's fluttering in the wind. And um, uh, of course a lot of people don't realise that, well obviously everyone realises that without uh, any air on the moon, there's no wind, and without wind, the flag is just going to hang down, sort of something like that, which is really not very uh, patriotic for an American flag. So what they did was they just inserted a curtain rail in the top of the, uh, the flag and hung it out. On Apollo 11, when they tried to extend the curtain rail, it jammed. Um, they had a bit of a problem, so they couldn't extend the curtain rail as fully whoops, as they could, and so it sat there with a wrinkled appearance. Um, this is one which it probably can't be easily addressed by the points I've raised, but it is probably worthy of some experimentation. What you have to, have to be careful of is the difference in conditions between the Earth and the Moon. It's very hard to test 
a vacuum and one sixth gravity on the Earth. Uh, and it's probably a little bit tricky to go to the moon to experiment there. Um, the other point that people make is they look at uh, video footage of the flag on the moon and they see uh, very clearly video footage of the flag swinging back and forth. And they say, well, you know, the flag would be swinging like this if there wasn't a breeze. Uh, the only point is the only time you ever see the flag flagging is when the astronaut is twisting the flagpole trying to get it into the ground. <laughs> and so if you are sort of swinging this flag back and forth, or flag the pole back and forth, the flag's going to keep swinging. And it stays swinging for a little while after you've stopped fiddling with the flagpole because the flag has inertia. The momentum around it is going to keep swinging. And there's no air to stop it from swinging. It just slows down eventually. Um, the counter to that one, perhaps, is to look at the footage of the astronauts walking past the flag. They walk past an inch from it, and the flag doesn't stir. You try doing, you try walking past a very white nylon flag here on Earth, and try not to disturb it with your uh, with, the, with your weight um, that, uh, that you cast in the air behind you. Um, very simply, there's um, the astronauts walk past the flag and it doesn't move. Uh, from photo to photo, from the start of the mission to the end of the mission, you look at the photos of the, uh, of the flag, and the flag doesn't change its shape over the whole time. Yes. Yeah, the astronauts not being able to jump, you know, five or six uh, feet in the air or, or whatever. They're also wearing heavy, heavy backpacks and uh, while on the Earth, uh, that would really weigh them down. On the Moon, uh, it, weighs, it weighs them down quite a bit less. But they're still not going to be able to jump as high as they would be able to if they were uncomfortable. The, um, it's absolutely true that on the Moon, even with a huge backpack, they would weigh terribly much. But um, something that people have a little bit of trouble with is that there's a difference between weight and mass. Weight is the number that appears on the scales when you stand on them. Mass is just how much of you there is, regardless of, uh, of what the actual gravity is. Um, and the best way, the best illustration I've seen of that argument is, imagine you're standing in front of a wall as a giant zeppelin that is floating in the air, but still weighs 100, still has a mass of 100 tons, floats towards you. It's weightless, it's floating in the air. But it's still going to crush you um, if, it, uh, if you're between it and the wall. Uh, as far as the astronauts' backpacks are concerned, imagine you're wearing a very heavy rucksack. What it's going to do is pull you back, so you compensate by leaning forward. The problem is when you jump, you straighten your legs and it pulls your weight back. And as a result, the astronauts who tried jumping found that they were rotating backwards. And in fact, one astronaut who tried to jump quite high did land on his backpack and had a momentary panic thinking, oh, crap. I've just gone bust my uh, space and I'm going to die. He survived. His commander told him, you know, you're an idiot. And uh, they got off on the mission. But um, the backpack and the astronaut together on Earth would weigh something like, oh, my mass isn't very good at this, about 140 kilograms, I think. Um, and obviously only about 20 kilograms on the moon. So it's very easy to use your strength to move, but your, balance, your sense of balance is still thrown out. Yes? Uh, my question relates um, not just to the moon post, but to things like intelligent design and flying saucers and so on. No matter how many of these um, people's arguments you lost, they or others keep coming up with new flaws in <coughs> what's generally believed. Um, how do you overcome that? Uh, it depends how seriously you really want to take the whole issue. And this goes back to the very first point I made, that skeptics have only a limited amount of time. With a lot of theories, if it's something like UFOs, frankly, they really aren't a major um, threat to society. Intelligent design, on the other hand, in my opinion, is a serious threat to, uh, to scientific education uh, in Australia, more, more precisely in America. Um, if that's the case, you just keep uh, keep back at them. Every time they raise a new argument, you knock it down. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to go on the offensive either. If they, uh, if they don't happen to raise an argument this week, raise a criticism of their argument and just keep pressing the point. Uh, the point is not, uh, the, the, point, the important point is how important is that particular, or how much of a threat is that particular uh, belief system to, um, to our society. Yes? 